Welcome to a very special edition of the Cross Border Interviews live edition via YouTube on Tuesday, June 7th, 2022. And as you see, I am with our guest today, and that is the former Member of Parliament for P uh, Prince George Peace River, former Government House Leader, former uh, Government Whip, if I'm not mistaken, Opposition Whip, and then retired, came back, decided to start a party in uh, 2020. The Maverick Party was the interim leader for two years. And now I guess I can say he's in his second retirement now. <laughs> Jay Hill, the actual the Honorable Jay Hill. Jay, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's mine, Chris. So, Jay, I got to start with the, que the interview off with the exact same question I have asked every single politician who's come on this show. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, I, I suppose it started at the dinner table with my parents on the farm, you know, and uh, they, even though they weren't actively involved, you know, other than donating at election time to the candidate of their choice, uh, they were always uh, talking politics at the table. And some of my both fondest and, and uh, uh, amazing experiences at the dinner table was... Uh, discussions, nay, nay, I say arguments, between my maternal grandfather, uh, who is a fellow by the name of Al Dubo, uh, a good uh, French-Canadian, and, uh, and my father, Don Hill. <clears throat> and uh, so he argued with his father-in-law, my grandfather, a lot of times because uh, uh, my grandpa was a strident, ardent uh, Pierre Trudeau fella, a liberal through and through, and my dad was a John Diefenbaker conservative. So uh, a lot of political discussions when I was growing up on the farm. I can imagine that the dinner table conversations were very lively in that time, <laughs> especially if, if there was a former Diefenbaker fan and a former Trudeau fan <laughs> in British Columbia, I'm assuming? That's right. Yeah, <laughs> northern British Columbia, just north of Grand Prairie, Alberta, uh, in a, at that time, a quite a small town of Fort St. John. And the farm is still there. One of my younger brothers has it, and uh, right on the banks of the Peace River, beautiful part of the country. So I, I guess the question that has to be asked, duty to serve is about that, but duty to serve in politics, where did that come from? Because in 1993, you were elected as a reform member of parliament yep. in the great Pe Preston Manning sweep uh, of Western Canada. Uh, by, but I think if I remember that election quite well, I think it was about 7.30 Ontario time, the whole election was called because John Chrétien had swept all of Ontario but one seat. Yeah. What made you decide to put your name forward in that election? Well, it was sort of a gradual uh, evolution, I guess, in my political involvement. And how it really came about was that I was farming with my father and, and one brother, and I, I guess I just became active in a lot of farm organizations. And myself and another group of uh, small, uh, small town boys from both North and South Peace, so centered around Fort St. John and Dawson Creek, uh, formed a, a new political entity uh, to represent grain farmers. And it was called the, the BC Grain Producers Association, and I was the founding uh, vice president and over a period of a couple of years became the president of that organization so it was very active on the lobbying side so on the other side of the table with politicians more at the provincial level but also a couple trips to Ottawa uh, lobbying on behalf of green farmers going through some very difficult times so that kind of got me in the door if uh, so to speak and then I also got involved in things like the uh, BC Provincial Seed Fair, where I was uh, the chairman of that or organization. It seemed like everything I got involved in, I ended up taking on a leadership role. And so when the Reform Party came along, it wasn't even a Reform Party when I first joined. It was a Reform Association yeah. in the mid-80s. And, you know, how did I first hear about this? Uh, through a magazine called the Western Report. Uh, that was uh, Ted Byfield's product, and <laughs> yeah, and uh, so a group of uh, politically active people with the Progressive Conservative Party federally and the Social Credit Party provincially in in British Columbia um, noticed me and uh, through association urged me to run when all of a sudden we had that 1988 election thrust upon us. The party was less than a year old. It was formed by Preston Manning and, and of course, in Winnipeg of, 
of 1987. And so the similarities with the last election campaign in the Maverick Party are quite stark. Uh, the party was less than a year old. I was 35 years old at the time. I had three young children. I was enjoying my life as a farmer. Uh, but I felt the call um, and I was convinced by some people that I held in high regard to step forward. Of course, in 1988, none of us won, not even Preston. Yeah. And uh, it we got wiped until out. until a year later. Oh, yeah. Not even a year later. Yeah, a about months. six months, four, four, six months or something. Yeah. Uh, the, the gentleman, I don't recall his name, uh, progressive conservative incumbent that held the riding of Beaver River yep. in central north Alberta, uh, passed away shortly after the election uh, from cancer and um, and Deborah Gray won the by-election the next spring and she had to hold the fort for us in Ottawa all by herself uh, for I guess close to five years four and a half years and just to make sure everyone knows that we did have an interview with Deborah the Honorable Deb Gray a few uh, I think back in uh, actually a year ago this month, uh, so last year, go back and check it out because it's a highly recommended interview because she is a colorful person and she does not hold anything <laughs> back in that interview. No, she certainly has that reputation and it's been hard earned and she's got this, the political scars to prove it. Exactly. Um, before we start talking about the future, because I don't want to stick too much into the past, I want to ask you one last question because I always find this answer so telling about what type of politician you were or will be or are. You are one of few people who have ever stepped foot in the House of Commons and served in the House of Commons as an elected official. Take me through that very first moment when you walked into that room. What task and what feeling did you have when you walked in knowing that the decisions you make, the decisions you put forward, are going to affect Canadians across BC, across Canada, and potentially around the world because federal government dictates federal policy as well and international policy. Yeah. Well, all I can say is it's an in, in just an incredible moment the first time you walk into the House of Commons. I don't know whether it's the same now that the center block is, uh, you know, under... Um, uh, remodeling, um, much needed by the way, and it's going to cost billions and that's kind of a sad part I guess, but uh, but I do believe and I do support any government, including the existing one, uh, their efforts to maintain those buildings. Uh, there's so much history there. Uh, so the first time that I walked into center block, into the chamber, um, it's it's an enormous privilege and a, a bit of a burden in the sense that it, you know, it, it really weighs on you the responsibility you have to your people back home. And I've always believed, Chris, that setting partisan politics aside, it doesn't matter whether you're in that chamber as a bloc Québécois, as a NDP, a liberal, conservative, or now a Green Party. Um, I think that the vast majority of people are there for the right reasons. They truly believe in what they're doing. Uh, they accept that enormous privilege and responsibility and do their best for their constituents. And certainly that's, that would be the feeling that struck me. And it stayed with me throughout 17 years. Even you know years later when I was a cabinet minister, I can remember still walking up uh, that laneway to the House of Commons, to Centre Block, and on occasion just kind of stopping and thinking, oh my God, uh, I'm one of the few Canadians that has that privilege. Now let's turn to the future. And thank you for answering that question. I, like I said, I, I, I've loved asking that question to politicians and your response just tells me that you were in it for the right reasons as well. But I wanna turn my, uh, our attention now to the big issue, the big sign that's right behind you right now, and that is the Maverick Party. Mm -hmm. You uh, officially ended your term as interim leader, uh, I think actually last month. Uh, and you are now into a semi-second retirement. You're probably still going to be active in politics, but you are no longer the face of the Mavericks. Colin Krieger, the uh, leader, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Yeah, because Krieger, yeah. Krieger. Um, I want to go back to the beginning. Let's talk about 2020 and why you decided to come out of politics after 10 years of retirement and get involved because you retired in 2010. You decided to come back in 2020. What was the decision behind that? 
and starting this new party, West, the West's only federal, or the Canada's only Western federal party, the Maverick Party. Well, I think, like most things for myself, Chris, um, it was sort of a slow burn. And, uh, and actually, the first few months that uh, after I started the Maverick Party, I can remember remarking to, uh, you know, most of it was via Zoom because we were in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, but I can remember to uh, um, remarking to a lot of folks that uh, I admitted that I was a slow learner. I had spent the vast majority of my life, uh, adult life, involved in politics at some level. As yeah. I said, I started out in farm politics, graduated to uh, to federal politics with the Reform Party, then the Canadian Alliance, then merging the two parties, and then ultimately a Conservative Party and ending in uh, Stephen Harper's cabinet. And uh, I had to come to the, the realization that what I had been doing and trying, I believe, trying my best to do as part of a team wasn't working. And uh, in the sense that the constitution of the country, the way governments are formed in Canada does not treat Western Canada fairly. It never has. And I had to come to the realization that it never will. And really the tipping point for me, and I think for a lot of Westerners, was the re-election of Justin Trudeau, after all the scandals, all of the disastrous uh, management of Canada's affairs, he was re-elected, albeit to a minority, in 2019. And with less votes at the same time exactly. than the Conservative Party. That's right. Yeah, the Conservatives under Andrew Scheer actually won uh, the popular vote. And, um, you know, so there I am sitting there and uh, the ultimate motivation for me back in 1988, as I said, I was 35 years old, had a job I loved, um, and uh, three young children. Then I had three young grandchildren, and, uh, and I started looking at this situation and saying, oh my God, I mean, it's deja vu. It's all over again, and I've, I've just spent a large portion, 30 years or so of my life working within a system that doesn't treat my region and my province uh, fairly. And that was the motivation for me to come out of retirement the following spring. I started having conversations with a number of people, people that I respect, about what can be done about this. And eventually that led me to the founder of the Wexit Canada Party, a man by the name of Peter Downing. Yeah. And he was getting sort of mixed reviews, I guess I can fairly say, at the time. And I had a number of conversations with Peter through the spring of 2020. And uh, he graciously uh, made the, the decision that he would step back and allow myself uh, to take over as an interim leader of Wexit Canada. Why did I go that route? Uh, was because they had already done, he and a small number of volunteers, had already done, already done a lot of work to get Wexit Canada, uh, their application for registration with the Elections Canada to be a federal party. They'd already gone through all of that. And there's a lot of steps involved and signatures you have to collect in one thing and another. And um, so I thought, okay, well, they've taken the first step. Let's take it further. And uh, so Peter stepped away, I stepped in, I made a lot of phone calls, gathered together uh, seven people to sit on the original board. Um, the, our first Zoom meeting uh, was uh, June 18th of 2020, so just coming up on two years. Oh, wow. And two years later, we are now in a uh, new whole world. We've seen the re-election of another Trudeau government, so even though a more divided government that we are currently in, a more divided time, I should say, we are currently in, because in the last election we saw um, the Conservatives win more rural seats and the Liberals win more urban seats. The city-country divide is there. Um, I want to talk about that election from your standpoint. Um, you ran 35 candidates across the uh, the country, or 37? 29. No, oh, 29, I apologize. Yeah. I do apologize for that. Yep. Um, 29 candidates. Um, it was your first time out. You talked about that reform movement in 1988, and you didn't elect any first candidates, but now you have the uh, base 
you can grow. But take me through that moment after that election when you had to sit down and go, okay, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? And how do we move forward? Because at that time, I'm assuming you're thinking, I'm going to step down as interim leader. This was not a full-time job for me. This was a one and done, and then we'll pass it on to a, per a permanent leader or a an elected leader. So take me through the process after that election to where we are today and how you decided step down and where the boundary party needs to go from now. Here. There's a well, lot of questions in there. I yeah. apologize. Well, I'll have to back up a little bit. I just uh, mentioned that we had our first founding uh, sort of meeting or Zoom meeting uh, for the, our very small uh, yeah. group of volunteers, eight people that started this um, in June of 2020. So th throughout this, that summer of 2020, we, we kept working hard, um, donating thousands of hours, uh, obviously, uh, the eight of us, plus everyone else that we could pull into the, into the operation. And we really rebuilt that Wexit Canada party. I mean, the one thing we continue to still have is some of the bruises from, oh, well, you're the separatists. And not unlike, you know, what Preston Manning and the Reform Party was accused of way back in the 80s. You know, the, we had to dispel that. And so we went through the summer, we completely reworked Wexit Canada to become Maverick. And we launched under that banner, that name, uh, in September of, of 2020. And, and we had a controversy around that. I apologize no, for interrupting. Go, no, because absolutely. I remember that story coming out when you the, the, Wexit, uh, the party changed their name to the Maverick. Because another party who happens to be a Quebec MP at the time, uh, actually, was he? No, he was not in a Quebec MP, but the People's Party of Canada, Maxime Bernier, decides yes. to attack you for ch taking his name Maverick because <laughs> he's the true Maverick and you have taken his name and put it onto a party. Um, like, did you have to laugh at that? Because absolutely, can... <laughs> absolutely. There's a lot of things about uh, Max that uh, cause a chuckle. Uh, <laughs> Max, Max, and I, of course, go way back. I mean, uh, I was his whip for the first uh, Parliament yep. uh, when he fell into some troubles and left some documents at a girlfriend's place and uh, ended up getting chucked out of cabinet over it, and and then gradually worked his way back to his credit. And, uh, and so then the next parliament, uh, when I was a full cabinet minister as the government house leader, I sat in cabinet with Max and, and many others, of course. So our relationship goes back a long way. The, one of the things that I laughed about was why he would name his party that he started out in really in retaliation to the Conservative Party of Canada. Was it retaliation to the CPC, do you think, or do you think it was retaliation to Andrew Scheer? No, I think it was mainly to the party that he'd lost that election, more so than Andrew. I mean, you could debate whether it was Andrew's style of leadership that, yeah. that he rebelled against and started, you know, went off and started his own party. Uh, but what I, what I really chuckled about was his choice of names. You know, when you talk about the Maverick name and us picking that up and, and using it as the name of our new party, uh, I mean, that he would call his party the People's Party when it really should be the Max Bernier Party because it is a party of one man for, you know, basically for, for his own purposes, at least in my opinion. I thought you were going to say you were going to chuckle at the name of the People's Party of Canada. Like, how more close to Chinese People's Party of China <laughs> can you get there? I apologize. I, I've interviewed a few PPC candidates, and they're uh, nice people. And like you said, they're all doing it for the right reasons, but... That was the one that was the head scratcher for me. I was like, okay, that's kind of weird, but here we are. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so the, the Maverick Party came about in, in, um, in uh, September. And of course, we knew that, that well, there could be an early election. And so even though we're scrambling to do the myriad things that you have to do when you're putting together a party, and really, when we started in June of 2020, none of us on that original board had any idea of uh, how much work it was going to be. I mean, as you know, um, my uh, involvement in the early stages of, of the Reform Party was very much at the local level, building one constituency association. Yes, it covered a quarter of the, <laughs> the, the geography of British Columbia and was split in half by the Rocky Mountains, so it was a huge challenge for myself and, and my supporters, but it was one constituency. Yeah. And so now there we were with a small, very small group of people trying to organize in Western Canada, four provinces, 
and um, uh, 107 ridings, you know. And uh, so we're scrambling, and, and the whole time hanging over us is the possibility of a very early election call by Mr. Trudeau. So... Um, because in we're, 2020, there was speculation that they could happen like that fall, hap, like a drop of a hat, right? Yeah, because exactly, COVID was happening, and people were okay. We need a mandate and all that, and then they, he started playing politics. Aaron, the, the conservatives were in the midst of a leadership campaign because the leader Andrew Shear had to step down. Aaron O'Toole had to basically be put off, and Peter McKay were challenging each other. So yeah, politically, it would have been a smart move for him because. In the midst of a leadership campaign, why not go to leadership? Uh, why not go to the electorate? But it'd be stupid in the in the at the end of the day as well because yeah. everyone would hold it against him because that's what Trudeau Senior did right in seventy nine and look what happened. Yeah, Clark came in. Um, so back to your question. Yeah, back to your question about you know what led up and then what happened after. You know, and I can be honest here, a completely disastrous. A result for Maverick uh, in that election campaign last fall. And uh, obviously, we were incredibly discouraged and disappointed and frustrated by those results. Um, wow. the, the parallels, Chris, between what I experienced and many others did with reform and everything that we went through with the evolution and the growth and the ultimate success of reform and what Maverick has and is going through are incredible when you really study it. I could probably write a book about it. I hope you do because <laughs> then I can autograph it and then you can put it on that shelf with all the other autograph books. <laughs> but, uh, you know, really, I mean, the the reasons for the very poor showing by Maverick and the reasons we could only organize in 29 writings. First of all, uh, we made a decision as a very small board. I've already said that we've, you know, I think we've, fluctuated between a low of a half a dozen and a high of 13 or something. Yeah. And people come and go as their personal lives and things that happen to them personally takes over and, and as you would expect with any organization. So we, we've gone through that evolution. We've gone through that, that, that growth as a party and maturity to some extent as a party, although we're a, a long ways from that from being mature at, at this point yet. We're still very much a neophyte, a two-year-old, less than two-year-old political party. Uh, but as I said, we had to go through developing our policies, our principles, our mission statement. We developed a twin track uh, mission statement, to, you know, to try and present to Western Canadians, but to the entire country, that the, the reason why, the raison d'etre for Maverick Party is that that we are tired and we're not going to take it anymore, the ill treatment, the abuse that we suffer from Central and Eastern Canada. And so we laid the groundwork for that. We went into the election campaign. We purposely decided that we were going to structure our candidate selection, uh, very uh, tighten that up to the point where we, we certainly didn't want to have anyone potentially embarrass the party all, and the other candidates, me as a leader, all the work that we'd done. And we've seen that happen. Um, my number one credit uh, issue from the time that I stepped out of retirement in June of 2020 was to create and grow credibility for this new entity, this new party. And I kept reinforcing that with everybody that came on board that if you do even a, a cursory examination of the history of new parties whether they're provincial or federal, scattered across the country, not yeah. just in the West, you will find that, that the vast majority of them self-destructed because they destroyed their credibility. They took, um, they took positions on controversial issues, and they could be myriad, uh, and they got themselves into trouble that they couldn't extract themselves and to the point where credible Canadians said, I'm not having anything to do with that party or that group. So I'm going to ask a, a kind of a controversial question here, but I think you're up for it, Jay, because I, you told me everything's on the record, and we'll, we'll chat, and we'll figure out how this goes. You were a former Conservative MP. You and along a few of your other former Conservative MPs during the Reform Canadian Alliance and the Conservative movement were instrumental in the behind-the-scenes of the Maverick Party. Um, 
Was it hard to go against your former party? Because I can imagine someone who was elected as a reformer, elected as a conservative MP, and then deciding, you know what, enough's enough. The party that I used to represent, the party that I belong to, is no longer the party that represents the, the true Western Canada, because they, as you just said, they take it for granted. So was there a bit of a, I, I don't want to say come to Jesus moment, but a, a moment, a realization in your head when you said, okay, I, I need to do this and because I need to stand for my principles and my values, and right now they're not being represented by the Conservative Party. Absolutely. And obviously there's been some pushback. I mean, you don't serve the amount of time in politics at any level, but especially at federal level. Um, and the amount of time that I had spent there without developing some very deep personal friendships. Yeah. I mean, there's that old adage, right? They use the comparison with the military, uh, you know, in the trenches, uh, you know, going over the top and, and you know, somebody having your back. Uh, all of these types of, of sayings, um, and they apply very well to politics. I mean, it is a tough life. And I'm not saying that, you know, that, you know, you know applaud Jay Hill. Anybody that enters politics, especially nowadays with the advent of social media and how critical people are uh, and rude and crude, and, you know, and to subject not only yourself, but your family and your friends to that, to step forward. It's a tough, tough job. So um, you really place a lot of emphasis on loyalty, your friendships uh, that you develop during those and you all share the scars. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it was a tough decision for myself and for, for Val uh, Fraser now, Val Meredith at the time, a longtime colleague uh, that is still serving with Maverick Party, uh, Leon Benoit. Good old Leon. Uh, well, you know, well. he, yeah, uh, he actually served longer. I think he served 21 years longer, yep. so even longer than I had served before I went back to the private sector. And uh, Alan Kirpen, who served as my deputy leader for the first year and a half or so of, of Maverick um, from Saskatchewan. So, I mean, those four people, Did you like burn my bridges. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Are you upset about that? It doesn't seem like you are. No, uh, no, I'm not upset in the least. Uh, I just recognize that it's a reality for the decision that I believed and and these other folks believed had to be made. That uh, it was time to call it the way it is. And I might correct you in the sense that it's not just the Conservative Party; it's any federal party that uh, runs candidates coast to coast to coast falls into that trap. Oh, and I completely <clears throat> understand it. Just in your situation, you, you were a former conservative because the one thing I heard, and we can talk about it if you're up to it, is how can Jay Hill lead this party against the conservatives? You're going to vote split. You're going to elect liberals because I'm assuming you heard that. And Absolutely. And, exactly. And in 2019... Um, the Liberals didn't elect anyone outside of uh, in Saskatchewan or Alberta. In this last election, we can talk about Aaron O'Toole and his dismal performance to begin with, because as much as I know the man, he's a good man. I know his father, John. Um, he's pro he's probably a great guy. It's just his form of politics of GTA politics doesn't work in Alberta, so voter turnout went low. Um, in 2019, uh, Jeff, I'll interrupt you there, though. Okay. In, in the sense that I don't know Aaron well. I've only had one ever, ever conversation with him. It was during the leadership run yep. when he was running against my old cabinet colleague, Peter McKay. And Aaron called me and we had a good conversation. This would have been in the spring of 2020 before I started Maverick. And he was looking for my endorsement, obviously, uh, yep. in Western Canada. And uh, so I don't know him well. Uh, but I have some empathy for him, for what he tried to do. Um, he, he didn't do it well, uh, but I, I think that most people that understand the failings of Confederation and the, our Constitution, the way we're structured, yeah. the way we're governed, the fact that we have a tyranny of the majority in Canada, always have had and always will have until the West decides to do something about it. Okay, so... Aaron made some promises, whether it was no carbon tax or, you know, signing that Canadian taxpayers uh, pledge uh, and then reneged on it. Why? Because he knows 
he cannot win without Central Canada, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's the failing of our system. And so he had to make promises he couldn't keep in Western Canada and then turn around and try to appeal to Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, Peterborough, uh, you name it, right? down. You're from there, yeah, so exactly. you understand it. No, it's that. a numbers game. It is. And to Aaron's credit, he understood that. Uh, but he did it, might I say, in my opinion, he did it clumsily. Yeah. And that he got caught out on it constantly, where the things that he'd said during the leadership race were in direct contrast to what he was doing immediately afterwards and trying to appeal to Central Canada in order to get enough votes to actually win. And that's the problem with the way uh, the Canadian political system is structured. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the Conservative Party, Liberals, NDP, whatever. We are a country of regions. We're culturally distinct. We are different. And I don't mean that just for Western Canada. I mean Quebec, Ontario, Maritimes, Newfoundland even by itself, the <laughs> North yeah. has its own culture, its own interests, its own issues, and certainly the West does. And so we are this country of regions that is working under a system that does not work for the individual regions. And I, for one, am fed up with it, and I want to make a stand on that for my children and grandchildren. Do you think there's a growing resentment? Do you think more people are coming over to the your way of thinking right now? Because... Uh, I've talked to people. I've talked to, I know uh, uh, Dan Olson out in uh, Manitoba. He's gone across Manitoba and set up all riding associations in each of the ridings in Manitoba. Uh, I know that Colin, the new leader, wants to get members signed up in, before the fall. Are people coming? When you were the leader, you saw the membership numbers. Were, was the party growing? Were people getting pissed off? Well... Yes and no. Uh, the no, sadly, is there's a level of apathy. You know, I mean, it's a contradiction because on one hand, you have uh, people getting involved, coming out to uh, protests, to meetings. And now that we can legally, uh, you know, with the, at least some of the restrictions being lifted uh, over the, uh, the COVID uh, uh, business. Um, but on the other hand, the app, the, look what happened recently in Ontario. What was that, like uh, less than a week ago? Yeah. And uh, lowest voter turnout in history. I mean, people, are, are, is it because they are so disillusioned with their choices that they just didn't bother? Uh, was it sort of at least partially uh, uh, sort of the after effect of COVID and being locked down and people just are finding it hard to get geared up again to caring about things? including politics and, and the effect it might have on their lives. I don't know. Uh, it's discouraging for me and I think for people that are involved in politics at any level and any party and certainly trying to start a new party <laughs> like Maverick, um, you know, that, that people are choosing not to be involved. I often hearken back to something that uh, I'm sure was said years and years ago, but that I sort of relate to Preston Manning because I can remember him saying to me, is that people that choose not to get involved in politics are destined to be governed by those that do. Yeah. And that's a reality in any democratic nation in the world, not just Canada. You know, and so you need the involvement of people. And even though, you know, the, look at that amazing support that one of the Maverick, uh, my Maverick colleagues, Tamara Leash, managed to mobilize for that freedom convoy yeah. and the demonstration that that succeeded it in uh, in uh, Ottawa you know and the unfortunate outcome but it, I mean millions of dollars and most of it in like $20 bills that people just went online and supported that effort so on one hand you have that which would signify that there's something happening under the surface people are starting to rise up and rebel I mean that started out, and rightly so, as a protest against truckers' mandates, right? And, and then it grew from there. Uh, but whether it's people in Alberta that are showing up for these, uh, these, these town hall meetings uh, by different organizations that are advocating, you know, a um, uh, defense of our freedoms or whatever it is, there's, there's an undercurrent of something that's happening. Now, how it en ends up um, solidifying, I don't know. 
I was hoping that we'd get greater support for Maverick of people that are saying enough, enough. Okay. I, I love interviews like this because I like to play in sandboxes from time to time. And when you bring up a subject, I like to play in that sandbox. You talked about the Freedom Convoy. Let's, If you're willing to chat about that for oh, a few minutes, I, sure. I want to talk about that. Um, one of the big things that I heard over and over again from conservative politicians from people at West is, why doesn't Trudeau just meet with the truckers? End it today. Even just listen to them. You don't need to do anything. You just need to listen to them, right? My thinking in the back of my head, and correct me if I'm wrong here, and this is the great thing about you who served in his cabinet, is would Stephen Harper have met with the convoy? Would Stephen Harper, would he have met with indigenous leaders who were protesting and doing the hunger strike on Parliament Hill? Because I'm just think I'm looking at it as a political operative here and just looking at it from a political standpoint and saying, what does Trudeau gain by going out there and meeting with the convoy, Right. Because I don't remember Stephen Harper going out and meeting with protesters in Tyantanega, Mohawk Territory, when they were shutting down the CN Rail to block some of the trains going by. So just talk to me, what benefit do you, would you have seen if Trudeau would have just walked out of his office, sat down with one or two of the leaders of the convoy, and just talked to them? What would the benefit be in that situation? And would Stephen Harper have done it if in your cabinet well, during your time in office? Well, it's a twofold question. I guess, yeah. for, for, first of all, let's deal with the past. Uh, I said at the time and throughout that demonstration in Ottawa that I, in my experience, I don't believe there was any prime minister previous to our current prime minister that wouldn't have met with them. And certainly no prime minister that I knew, whether it was Stephen Harper, Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, you go down the list. Well, we all know that great. Right? <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, they were astute enough politicians to recognize that these people had a legitimate beef, all right? And you don't start out a negotiation or a relationship with that group of Canadians. My God, you're the prime minister for the entire country. You're supposed to treat people with some degree of respect, some modicum of respect. From the time they started to organize, even before they left Western Canada, he was denigrating them. You know, this terrible fringe in his mind. And why? Because he took it personally, he being Justin Trudeau, took it personally that that these Canadian citizens were actually rebelling. They were they had the nerve, the gall, to rebel against something that he put in place. In this case it was a, a trucker's mandate. You know, and so he tried his best and he got the entire government uh, operation um, um, uh, behind him, obviously, uh, to continue to attack them. When all he had to do was keep his mouth shut as they moved across the country. He didn't have to say anything positive or negative. And then when they came to Ottawa, all he had to do was meet with them. My God, it's how simple is that? As a politician, all my life... Did you uh, meet with protesters? Yeah, I, well, I don't specifically remember. Yeah. But um, th- I was just going to say, the, the my bottom line was always that I was willing to meet with anybody, anywhere, anytime. And uh, people always get um, down on this terrible word, lobbyist. I used to say, I, could, I like meeting with lobbyists. Why? Because I don't know everything about everything. Hell, most days I don't know anything about anything. And, and you know, let alone everything. And um, so if I can get an education, a free education by, you know, having lobbyists come to my office, whether it's in the constituency or in Ottawa, and educating me a little bit about issues that matter to them and why they think the government, whether I'm in opposition or in government, why they think the government's on the wrong path, I think that's positive. Yeah. That's sort of fundamental to democracy in my mind. And yet you have a prime minister that I believe, Chris, I believe this with all my heart and soul, is the, the most unqualified, uh, unethical uh, individual that has ever held that office, by far. But he still gets elected. Yes. What is that about? In your opinion, because you've been around the block, you you saw Stephen Harper have to win votes in downtown Toronto, and that's where Justin Trudeau's uh, core support is, is downtown Toronto, Montreal, Atlantic, Canada, Quebec, and Ontario. What is happening? 
why is he getting elected in your opinion? Well, I think Does he know that, what to say in downtown. Well, I think I think it's like you know Doug Ford. It's like Stephen Harper when he uh, you know. And Stephen and I actually talked about this a few times. Part of the either the uh, you know is involves some degree of luck, because you're you're viewed as uh, you know as the a, a matter of choice against your competitors, right? And obviously, for whatever reason, Andrew Shear, uh, well, initially uh, Stephen, and it can be argued that. In 2015, it really was just a matter that people had tired of Stephen Harper and the Conservatives. Ten years and, is usually. Yeah, and that happens, and we all know that happens under our system. And uh, you know, so setting that aside, what happened in 2019? All of those scandals, including the blackface and the SNC Lavalin scandal, and you run down that shopping list. Uh, you know, the, the ex all expense trip to the, the Aga Khan's uh, Island and, you know, where he actually was found by the ethics uh, commissioner to be uh, ha having breached the ethics rules. I just find it funny that when, when, you're, when the ethics commissioner has to put out report Trudeau number two and Trudeau <laughs> report number three, I think it's time to start thinking that we need new leadership. Yeah. One, okay, we all fuck up from part of my friends. We all screw up from time to time. But two and three, okay, something's happening here. And you know what? I, I'm, I'm happy to sit down at Justin Trudeau. I know it's probably not going to happen because I've said some disparaging things. I was, for any, for transparency reason, I everyone knows this who's listened to the show. I was a candidate for the Liberal Party in 2015. The moment I got uh, the nomination, the person who was from the party looked at me and said, you're not going to win. Shut up. Don't talk to us. We're sending your money. Any money that you raise is going to Edmonton because Northern Alberta is not going to elect you. So I was like, okay, thanks. Because I'm a, I'm a Chretchen Trude, uh, liberal, right? I, fiscal policy is my thing. Balance the budget. I'm a happy camper, right? Don't spend more than your means. End of the day. But, yeah, that was a bad well, on that Sorry, there, on that fundamental there. issue, it's interesting, and and these are the things that I found, especially in the multitude times that I was the caucus whip, and so you have to interact and and negotiate with the part other parties' whips. Same when I was opposition house leader. Same when I was government house leader. You're negotiating sometimes multiple times a day with your uh, colleagues in those positions and the other parties. It's interesting you say that, Chris, because we have common ground. The number one reason, not all the only reasons, but the number one reason that I originally ran for the Reform Party was the deficit and debt and my concern for my children's future. The number one reason that I came out of retirement two years ago was because of the deficit and the debt and the, the wanton, crazy spending that continues today and the mortgaging of my grandchildren's future. That's the number one reason. So on that, you and I are in total agreement. I, I could not agree more, Jay. And I, I love these conversations because I'm willing to chat with anyone. We may not agree on exactly 100% of the issues. But if we don't talk to each other, the division in our country is going to be so far gone that we won't even be able to sit at the same table as each other as we just saw with the Freedom Convoy. We can't even sit at the same table together and have an adult conversation. Well, well, we'll end up like the Americans, exactly. unfortunately. And, you know, I have the great benefit and the privilege of spending time in the States uh, from time to time and have had for years. And uh, I love the Americans, and I'll freely say that. Uh, but they have their problems as well. And one of their problems is exactly where Canada's headed, is that it's becoming, just as you just said, Chris, more and more and more divisive to where you don't even listen to what the person is saying. They're a Republican. Oh, well, they don't know anything. They're idiots. Yeah. You know, oh, you're a Democrat. Oh, well, you know, you believe in wokeism and, yeah. you know, you, you classify people just because they support a certain political party. And that's where we're headed in Canada with this divisiveness that we've seen really manifest itself to a new degree during the lockdowns and the pandemic.
I have friends who were uh, who were former conservative staffers when I worked at Queens Park in Ontario. I have friends from the NDP from the and I have I keep in touch with them on a regular basis because we're friends and we can talk about politics and at the end of the day if we disagree we'll go well f you or f that and we'll go along our day right part i swear a lot on this show i apologize um i I'm just looking at the time we have about 15 minutes left and i want to get in a few topical issues right now and unless you have a few extra minutes and you're willing to stay with us <laughs> for a few minutes but i'll try and keep well it. let's see where it goes I'll, I'll see if we um colin is the new leader of the maverick What's his next step, in your opinion? What does he have to do to build on what you've already built on for the last two years? And we're going to have him back on the show as well, and we're going to sit down. Well, I think he was pretty clear of that, clear about that during the campaign when he was running against Tarek El Nega, uh, the only other competitor yep. for the leadership. Um, the two of them explained, I thought, did a pretty good job of explaining to the members their different approaches to leadership. And uh, Collins, if I can use the term, is, is a little bit more sort of the old style to get out eyeball to eyeball like you and I tonight yep. uh, and uh, have those conversations with people across Western Canada. And he did it during the leadership race, put on thousands of kilometers on his truck and, uh, you know, sort of in a bit in like my style, which I admit is a bit dated in that sense. I mean, we have, we do live in this modern era of social media and, uh, you know, the fact that uh, you can reach a lot more people with a two-minute video clip uh, on TikTok yeah. of you trying to sing or something uh, than you can with putting a lot of miles on a truck. So, uh, but anyway, Colin has committed to that endeavor. Um, he's obviously believes, and I think he's proven it, that he's got a He's got a forte for that, for that that face to face, uh, having those conversations with people, um, and bringing them on side. So I think that's his focus is going to be building the riding associations, uh, trying to have as many uh, candidates in place as possible, and obviously in order to have any chance in any riding, you have to look at the demographics, you have to look at how they voted in the past. We're going to appeal more to small C conservatives, libertarians, when I say we, I mean maverick, uh, than we will to people that believe in socialism. Yeah. So, you, you know, you got to balance that out where you're going to have your best chance and try to build your strongest associations and your strongest uh, support in those ridings and then get a good, strong candidate that people in that riding can relate to, which is, I think, a problem that the conservatives certainly have had in the past. Is um, you know uh, the Jason Kenney did a pretty good job, and that's why eventually Stephen Harper, or at least partially why Stephen Harper eventually won that majority in 2011, was getting into the ethnic communities, uh, convincing them quite rightly that when it comes to small C conservative principles, whether it's balanced budgets, whether it's lower taxation, whether it's support for small business, or whatever it is they can relate to that the, the ethnic communities can the same as you know uh people that have been here for generations um get going keeping time here uh we i want to talk about the federal politics uh, because your former party is currently going through a leadership race right now the two front runners and i say that kindly because we don't know where the numbers are coming we saw how many memberships pierre polyev and John Charest saying that he has a path to win and Patrick Brown being Patrick Brown and doing what Patrick Brown does best is I don't know what. Um, and I'm not saying that as a rude thing. It's just I, he's come to Calgary four times and no one knows that he's actually come here. Um, Pierre Polyev is looking like he's on a collision course to become the next leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. As a former Calgarian himself... Do you think that hurts the Maverick Party, having a Western leader of the Conservative Party? Because under Stephen Harper, he was able to hold the coalition together of the Progressive Conservatives and the Reform or Canadian Alliance. Do you think that Pierre can bring that coalition back and potentially not even need a Maverick Party? Or do you think there will be a Maverick Party needed no matter what going forward? Yes, there, Maverick will be needed because at some point in time, no matter who wins, the CPC leadership race, Westerners are going to come to the realization, belatedly, the slow learners, just like Jay Hill, 
are going to come to the realization that there is no federal political party, the CPC under Pierre Polyev or anyone else, that is going to solve the constitutional problems we have in Canada. And so he's going to have to appeal and eventually capitulate to the wishes of Toronto and Montreal to the detriment of the West. It's a fact. And, no, you know, no one can can do other than that. I had someone on the show uh, recently, uh, Sarah Biggs. She used to work for the Conservative Party of Canada in Quebec, and she's now out here. Uh, she says that there's a potential that because of how vitriol this leadership campaign is, there's going to be a division within the Conservative Party where it's going to divide East versus West in itself. Do you see that happening with what's happening in that leadership race now? Because it is the most toxic I've seen. Even like Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole, it wasn't that bad. Andrew Shearer and Maxine Bernier wasn't that bad as well. I've never seen more attacks from the two leading contenders than I have in this campaign. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you when you resort to attacking a, a, a colleague um, like uh, Mr. Cherie and saying, you know, he's a liberal and 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 worse than that, uh, as as Pierre has done, I think that th there is long term damage to the party because you're going to see people aligning and they are obviously behind individual uh, candidates. And so for someone that might end up being the party's leader, to be attacking the guy you're supporting in such, as you say, a, a, a toxic way. Uh, it's got us, I mean, leadership campaigns are terrible for party unity to begin with, even when you're respectful of one another, you know, and you're just putting forward different, different ideas of where you would take the party versus someone else, uh, like our two candidates did. They conducted a campaign. They were very respectful of each other. You know, and they recognized that that the way Tarek would uh, lead Maverick Party would be dramatically different, probably from the way that Colin would choose to do it. Doesn't mean that either of them are wrong or that they're not Mavericks, you know, or they're, oh my God, they're a liberal. Well, no, they're just people with different ideas. I think that's what you want in a leadership race. You know, so... Yes, I do believe that it's uh, the Conservative Party of Canada, no matter who wins, who comes out of this victorious, is going to be in bad shape. And I think that there's going to be a tremendous amount of uh, ill feelings at the, at the membership level all across the country, no matter who wins. I think their, their system um, lends itself to that, this goofiness, where the, the equality of ridings, which was a Peter McKay uh, insistence yeah. when in, when we put together the two parties when the two parties merged that was the deal breaker for Peter McKay and ironically he lost under that system um, where you know as long as you have more than a hundred members in a riding in rural Quebec you get the same weight to decide the next leader of the Conservative Party as a riding in downtown Calgary where you might have a thousand or five thousand members and um, whereas Maverick Party, when we put together our leadership race, we reverted back to the old reform principle. One member, one vote. Doesn't matter if you're in Tuktoyaktuk -tuk or Winnipeg or Vancouver, your vote counts the same. Yeah. One person, one vote. Yeah. And so we don't know, despite the fact that it appears as though uh, Pierre Polyev has sold hundreds of thousands of, of memberships, we don't know that he's going to win. But if... 100,000 of them come from Calgary Skyview and that has the same bearing of 100 points for yeah. someone who has sold 100 votes in Hull, Almer in Quebec. Exactly. It all depends. Ex I exactly. It completely negates one another. You know. Last question for you, Jay, before we do our wrap-up and that is turning provincially here. We have seen uh, your former colleague, Jason Kenney, uh, has resigned as Premier of uh, Alberta and leader of the United Conservative Party. After two years of sluggish political polls, he was going up and down, but the membership has voted him out. Um, I was shocked, were you, that he actually announced his resignation after uh, a tremendously bad two years? of COVID-19 with him? 
I wasn't shocked, no. Uh, I was actually disappointed that he hadn't made that decision on his own maybe two or three months before. Really? Um, because, and this is why, is because I think he would put himself into a no-win situation. And, um, you know, uh, with the, um, the outright protests against his leadership, both within the caucus and from outside, okay, from rank-and-file Albertans, and, and you have to really look, to me anyway, you have to look at what caused this. And I think it was is that, that he built such unbelievable expectations on the part not only of UCP members, up to and including the MLAs themselves, yeah. but rank and file Albertans that had gone out and voted for him in massive numbers. I mean, it was the biggest electoral victory, I believe, in Alberta history um, as far as his mandate goes. Yeah. So... Uh, but behind it was these expectations that he was going to to be the guy that was going to stare down Ottawa and uh, you know get Alberta elevated to our rightful place in Confederation, and so he set I think some some uh, parameters around his leadership that no person could live up to, and then you throw in some bad decisions I believe. Uh, when he went through the COVID, and those were tough, tough decisions. All premiers all across the country struggled with them, uh, those decisions about when to lock down, when to let up, how to protect the most vulnerable citizens. You go down and the list. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I, you know, I actually thought it would have been smarter for him, and I suspect he, he may have had some advice that he should have stepped down earlier because when it finally came down to his leadership review uh, vote with everything that transpired, I mean, it was going to be in person. That was the only way it was going to be credible. Then it was going to, you know, there's such massive interest in it, people buying up members, you know, there's no point belaboring it. But he got himself into a position where if the, if the result came in and it was what he needed, let's say 70%, right, yeah. support, nobody would believe it. And if it came under... Uh, you know, down to around 51% like it was, and he insisted that he was going to hang on because it was, you can't survive as a leader if you can only get garner 51% of your own membership. These are people that should love you, the majority anyway. And so he got himself into a position where he couldn't win. He could, you know, and I, and I think that's why, in my opinion, he should have come to that realization back in February or something and uh and take a walk in the snow exactly yeah to use um, an old phrase to, i want to talk about brian jean because brian jean was very very much the instrument behind somewhat of getting the ball rolling of saying we need a leadership review i'm gonna run as someone who was the whip of a, a political party and a government caucus how hard is it to keep a party in line when you're in government when you have someone like a Brian Jean character itching to be leader of the party well it's very difficult you know I pride myself on the fact that um, in all the times first of all there's nobody that has served in parliament that has been whipped more often than Jay Hill <clears throat> I was the the whip of the parties that I was associated with for four times uh, both in opposition and in government um, you know, so the whip is not just the disciplinarian. The whip, you know, the big challenge for the whip is to try and keep, work with the leader, very closely with the leader, and uh, to have uh, the level of morale and the sense of a team that a group of MPs or MLAs needs. And I think that was one of the big failures of, of Jason Kenney. Uh, I pride myself on the fact, I started out to say, that I, in all that time, uh, I only had to work with my leader to expel two individuals, ultimately. That's the ultimate sanction. And, um, you know, so there was a lot of other times where we had some very tough decisions to make to try to keep people inside the tent instead of chucking them out of the tent. And those are tough, multifaceted decisions that have to be made. Um, the, the problem I have as, a, as an outsider, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm a member of the UCP, but, but that's all. I mean, I haven't been involved in that party whatsoever, um, not since uh, the, uh, the exit of my good friend, uh, Jim Prentice. 
back before the days of the UCP when it was still a progressive conservative party. Um, so I don't have skin in the game. But I'll say this, Chris, is that the problem for the United Conservative Party right now, whether it's, uh, whether it's Brian Jean or whether it's uh, Travis Tabes or... Leela uh, or, here, who just Yeah, Leela or um, um, Smith, uh, Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith. You run down the list of the names that we keep hearing, and some of them are registered now to compete for the leadership. They're all from within the party. And just as we were just discussing the problems with the divisiveness at the federal level within the Conservative Party of Canada, and it's the age-old thing that as an, a long-standing whip and house leader that I fought against every day, which is this, that media will say to a political party, if you cannot govern yourselves, how in hell are you going to convince Albertans or Canadians to elect you to govern them? And that is the problem uh, with, that the UCP faces now. Uh, I mean, I shudder to think that Brian Jean would have a hope in hell of winning the leadership. Because if he does, every, uh, I would say, moderate uh, conservative is going to walk away. And so you, you think so? I do think so, absolutely. Okay. And, and some of that same problem is going to adhere to the other leadership candidates. Because... M Many of them are from are perceived at least from one camp or the other. Yeah. Right. UCP, to Jason C uh, Kenny's credit, was put together just as Harper and McKay put together the Conservative Party to try to bring all small C conservatives inside the tent. Yeah, but P Peter McKay wasn't backstabbing Jason Kenny after the leadership announcement. Right, because that's in some sense that's what Brian Jean was doing. In my opinion, was he kept on saying, "Oh, the results aren't the, the results were fixed, and uh, like uh, people were voting outside of that." Like after Peter McKay and Stephen Harper shook hands, it seemed like okay, that was it. Then they would then uh, oh, well, the first interim leader. Well, of the Peter McKay didn't run for the leadership. Well, that's what I mean. Though, Not right? then. I mean, the only time he's ever run for the leadership of the combined party yeah. was recently. No, against, but he, he, uh, didn't, he didn't come out against anything that happened, against the leadership no, merger. No. Even Belinda Stronach, she came in second against Stephen Harper in that first, in 2003, the leadership election. She was... She did cross the floor later, but that's here and over there. But she didn't. We could do a whole other program floor. about that. And then Tony Clement as well, right? Yeah. So there was three, three, three people, but there was no, the UCP like literally got out of the gate, merged, and then tripped over itself because the second place winner just didn't want to accept the results. Yeah. And it's sad because. And I agree with you. So we're in agreement. We can't have a conversation about this. Well, we can always have a conversation. <laughs> agreement. Jay, my last question is to this. What's next for you? Uh, you, you well, you I'm retired uh, twice. Is there like the Maverick 2.0 Alberta version going to start <laughs> up here? Well, uh, following along on the conversation we just had, I, I have encouraged and had a couple of conversations, and I don't know whether he would do it, uh, is for uh, someone like Tarek El Nega to compete in the UCP leadership race. Because I believe strongly as an Albertan, and again, looking at what's in the best interest of my grandchildren uh, going forward, that that party and the province needs a breath of fresh air. They really do, yeah. Chris. Uh, and I don't see it from any of the people thus far that have thrown, thrown their hat in the ring or have offered to step forward. We need somebody that can relate to both rural and urban uh, and Tarek can do that. Uh, we need somebody that can relate to new immigrants. He is an immigrant himself. We need somebody that will be at least as, as welcome in communities, ethnic communities in the, in the inner cities of Edmonton and Calgary as they will, you know, uh, walking through the, uh, the horse manure at a rodeo grounds. And Tarek would be that, and he's got great so is ideas. Is this a public endorsement right here, right now, of uh, Tarek to run? Absolutely, there? absolutely. Oh, wow. uh, right here, right now. Uh, I don't think he will uh, for some reason. You know, I mean, uh, he's a young man, so he can relate to the youth. He's got so much going for him. Um, but the hill to climb 
for an outsider. You understand politics perhaps even better than me, Chris. No, uh, you, you were <laughs> whipped. You know it much better than I do, Jay. Uh, so the hill to climb is monumental for an outsider to come into a political party, take the province by storm, sell some, enough memberships, raise enough money to actually go from arguably a nobody to premier of the province. Yeah. So uh, I think when you weigh all of that against the candidacy of somebody like Tarek, and it doesn't have to be him, it could be some other outsider, that as I said, that someone that the, the majority of Albertans could look to and say, you know, setting aside uh, Rachel Notley and the NDP, then, then they have their base of support. There's no question about that, and it's a strong base. But setting aside that, all of the majority of, uh, I believe, the majority of Albertans that I would class as non-socialist, okay? Yeah. Where are they going to go? And is that vote going to be sufficiently split that it effectively allows Rachel Notley to win by default? Which often happens. I mean, we only need to look again at, well, or look at Ontario. Yeah. Look at Ontario. What, what, you're just, what just happened. I mean, uh, 43%. With, yeah. Like, you know, and a, and a massive, shameful. massive win, right? I mean, 80, 80 MLAs, 83 MLAs. MPPs. M MPPs. MPPs. Yeah, Sorry. MPPs. Um, Jay, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this has been an honor of my life to have someone like you sit down with me and chat about politics. I, 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 I get so like giddy in myself whenever <laughs> I have politicians from uh, when I was growing up and when I was covering politics on the Hill in uh, 2007 to 2009. I ran into you once and I like you walked by me because I think you were going for a vote. <laughs> and I'm so, I'm so, like, I just can't believe that I'm sitting down with you right now in my house, just in Calgary, Alberta, to boot and just having a conversation <laughs> with you. So thank you so much. Oh, it's been my pleasure and uh, privilege to sit down with you, Chris. And uh, just let me thank you, too, for the interest that you took uh, all your life, basically. Obviously, I just need to look around <laughs> this room. Uh, you know, uh, all your life in politics. I wish, I so wish that more Canadians, and I mean that from coast to coast, not just Western Canadians, uh, took that kind of interest in politics because I really do, just to repeat again what Preston told me years ago, which is that those that choose not to become involved in politics are destined to be governed by those that do. And so I thank you for your interest. And thank you for asking me on your show. No worries. And I will leave on this now because I'm probably not a fan of yours or you're not a fan of his, but I had former Senator Mike Duffy on the show at the very first interview after he resigned or retired as a uh, senator. And he said that, uh, I just want to make sure I get this right here. He said, uh, politics is everything. Politics is your day-to-day -day life. You, The decisions you make politically, whether it be who you elect, who you want to represent you, are what's going to affect your life if you go to a sports game you leave the sports game afterwards and it doesn't affect you that much it might affect you you're pissed off that your team lost or you're happy your team won but politics and this is why i've loved politics all my life the people who we elect are the people that we need to hold accountable and i know i'm an independent show and i'm small and independent and all by myself here but when i get to sit down and have a conversation i find that I learned something, and I hope my listeners do too. So thank you for sitting down and doing this, and thank you for everyone who's tuned in tonight. Um, it's been greatly appreciated. Uh, we've had about 450 listeners audio version-wise. Tune into this. We've had about 15. Uh, our, vid our video is not the best, so subscribe to YouTube if you haven't already. Um, but thank you so much for everyone for tuning in and listening to tonight's conversation. The audio version will be uh, released in about two weeks. We're just going to put in some commercial breaks in that for the audio version. That's going to be on the actual podcast. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent rest of your day. And remember, everyone, go have a conversation with somebody um i know we like to hit be, hide behind our phones and keyboards but go have a conversation with somebody because it does make our democracy better our society better and it just makes us as a people better so with that have yourself an excellent day and remember guys keep it